Uh, so as Crystal mentioned, my name is Nicole Stewart. I've been in this industry a really long time. Um, so long that uh, the other day I realized that my company turned seven this November. So my company is at Nicole Stewart PR. If you're on Twitter, I like to connect uh, pretty much any way we can. Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, I'm there. So I've been doing PR for uh, lifestyle brands and events, typically. And I've done it both locally, nationally, and internationally. <laughs> I've placed people in Nylon Mag, Teen Vogue, uh, The Globe and Mail, uh, The New York Times, pretty much a whole lot of places, uh, as well as all the Vancouver traditional press, so Vancouver Sun, the province, etc. cetera. Uh, several times a week, I teach at the Visual College of Art and Design. I teach PR and marketing and electronic business classes. And a couple times a year, I go over and talk at Kwantlen. So that's why I guess Crystal asked me to come here is because I have that kind of a background. So um, let's get started. PR tips and tricks for community managers. So what does a PR person do? One of the big things that I do is I work on public perceptions and uh, trying to get people to see an organization or an event or uh, a store the same way that we want to be seen. So taking information from an organization and delivering it to the public. The second thing we work on is reputation management. So thinking about uh, who's in the headlines lately, oh, Miley Cyrus, is that intentional or not? Things like that. The third thing that I work on, which is typically what gets people's ears perked, is the generating publicity. So placing people on radio, TV, magazines, etc. So today, I'm going to try to cram a whole lot of information into a short period of time. We're going to talk about three different things. We're going to talk about one, strategizing. Two, how do you get press? And three, reputation management, as quickly as we can in the 45 minutes or so that we have. But first, let's start with finding common ground. What's the common ground between PR people and community managers? My theory is this. Community management is simply the 21st century version of PR because there is really no difference between the little things that we do. We're looking to engage with people. We're looking for people to have that sticky idea that they cling on to. And we're hoping that more and more people talk about it. So the things that I do on a regular basis benefit community managers and vice versa. And the common formula that I see is that we have strategy, creativity, and storytelling in what we do to help bring people together. So let's start with the first element, strategy. The big thing that you need to do is have a plan. And while some people have a plan, it's not always the best plan. So we think about plans in small sections, a lot of people. We think about what are we going to do on our Facebook page? What are we going to do with our email? How are we going to attract the press? And you think about them very isolated. But to be really successful, you actually need to think about it in one full swoop. So not just how are you going to engage with your community on Facebook, but how are you going to tie all of that together? So when we do campaigning for people, we actually create plans that encompass all mediums. So sometimes the plan will look like guerrilla marketing, Facebook advertising, traditional advertising, a PR outreach system, et cetera. But it's all together to meet our objectives, whatever that might be. The next thing is we define our objectives for every single project and campaign. So sometimes we're working on 8 to 12 clients at a time. And that can get confusing if we don't know what we're working towards. So it's not just busy work. So trying to make sure that we know exactly who we're going to contact and when, because it meets with the, the campaign strategy. So at different times, we've had different types of campaign objectives. Maybe the goal was to get in as much coverage as we could with just local bloggers. Well, that's what we focus on. It's not always about getting as much attention all the time from every place. We actually key our objectives based on what we think is going to get foot traffic somewhere or gain the most momentum. The next thing is know your audience. If you know your own audience, 
you'll have a much better chance of getting other people to pay attention to you. And what I like to do is segment the audiences and say, what different kinds of audiences are there and what can we do with that? Because the more I know about the different groups and clusters of audiences that participate in an event or participate uh, in shopping at a store, the more I can actually angle my pitches to the press. <coughs> Define our key messages. One of the first things that we do before we start a campaign is we say, how are we going to differentiate these people from everyone else who is their competitor? And we try to sum that up in a one sentence tagline. And we use that in pretty much all of our communication. And when it's effective, every single media outlet publishes it too. And that's when you know you've done it well, is when people start responding that way. So let's move on to the PR part, because I feel like that's where you really want to probably pick my brain. <laughs> so do unto others. Treat your relationships like gold. A TV producer that I work with frequently, <laughs> she tells me all sorts of stories about people who have signed up with her and then don't follow through and send her the stuff by the deadline. And that really sours her impression of that person and working with them. So I always like to think of the people I work with as being the most important people on the planet at that moment. And this can get really hard because I find with a lot of, um, a lot of people, you're busy doing everything, right? You're, you have to answer your phone here and answer your email here and maybe you have to run your business. And it can get really hard to prioritize the press but you have to make them a priority. So if they email you, our goal is to email them back within five minutes to an hour. And that quick turnaround time means that other people aren't going to be getting in that story instead of you. Also treating people well. Make friends. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself to people in the press. Make an introduction on Twitter. Make an introduction on LinkedIn. Ask if they want to go out for coffee. And I find the one-on-one -on -one connections with the press typically work better for you in the long run because you get to know them a little bit better. So it's not uncommon that on my days off I'll hang out with a TV producer or a radio show host. It's not because I have to. It's because you connect with certain people and you know that the relationship can go both ways. We can have a professional relationship as well as a friendship. Push and pull. So push refers to actually going out there and being proactive and looking for media people who fit with the dynamics of whatever it is you're doing. So let's say you're working on a brand, because most of you as community managers are probably working for one company doing that. So thinking about who you should contact. And the, the list shouldn't be... Uh, massive and inclusive for everyone. Every, every single project should have a particular list, a particular group of people you want to contact. Pull refers to making it easy for people to find you. A lot of people just put info at whatever it is on their website. That's not always the best way to go. While people will use those info at whatever the email address is, Often it's actually more useful to have set things. So for media contact, for uh, whatever it might be. So each, each thing that you want people to contact you for having a separate email address. It makes it a lot easier for the press to know who to go to and it makes it less confusing. And this is the big one. Don't take rejection personally. You're going to go out and you're going to contact the press. Some of you are going to use press releases. Some of you are going to use pitches. Uh, a pitch meaning a really tailored idea that brings an angle in. But not every idea works for every outlet at every time. And so you can't take it personally. When people tell you, oh, we don't want to do this, don't get reactive. Just say, oh, okay, that's fine. Hopefully we can work together at another time. And this is one of the things I find that my clients get worked up over. They, oh, they don't like me, or they don't want to do this. It's not that. It's just not the right time. 
And part of that is also knowing when you need to approach people at the right time. So I work with um, various people at different times, but let's say um, my contact, like Rebecca at Miss 604, some of you probably read that blog. I use that contact very sparingly because I really value that blog space, and so I only go to her when we have an idea that's going to be absolutely perfect. Same with a lot of TV producers. We don't just send them ideas. We wait until we have something that's perfect for that producer. And this is one that I think is very important. Help the media out even when it's not going to help you. I can't tell you how many times I send press information for things that I do not get paid for. And I don't do this because well, I, I, I am a good person, <laughs> out of the goodness of my heart. I do this because I know it's that if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours later. And it's that whole idea that if we help each other out, one day when they need something, they will come to me. And even when they don't know that I can give them something from my group, they'll still come to me, which means that I get more access and more, um, more contact with those press people. Make the media a priority, time is money. And I think I've already spoken to that. <clears throat> so the next one is get on the press train. So I have here, know what is newsworthy and listen. So what is newsworthy? Well, it's new is one of the big things. So I don't let my clients send something out that's old information. If we don't have anything new to say, we don't say anything at all. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll try and craft a scenario where we have something new to add to the game. Whether it's a new event, new vendors, a new location, like what these guys have at Make It coming up at the new PE forum, if you haven't heard, they're moving to a big venue. So you want to give the media something to talk about, something that's new to them. Timeliness. Oftentimes you can kind of figure out what the media is going to be talking about. You know that at Christmas they're going to be talking about Christmas stuff. At Halloween they're going to talk about Halloween stuff. In January, February, the Vancouver Sun is always going to talk about wedding stuff. So look for those cycles. If you're crafty, try and get your hands on editorial calendars. Most magazines and some online publications will have those, and that tells you exactly what they're going to talk about every month and sometimes week by week. That's really useful information because if you know the editorial calendar, you can make your pitches align to them perfectly, which means your pickup rate is quite a bit higher. Listen, and this is a big one. I'm constantly listening to what people are saying about my clients, about what my clients are saying, about what the news is saying, and trying to figure out sort of cultural trends. Because if you haven't noticed in the, in the media, they'll talk about particular items at a time, and it'll be kind of all grouped together. And if you can get a sense of what people are going to talk about when, you can send things out at just the right moment. And the benefit of that is, I get a sense that holiday stuff's coming, so we should probably send this out now. And a whole publication will pick up the whole thing that I just sent to them. And they'll call it their holiday gift guide, and that's fine. They, they don't need to put my name on it. <laughs> right? So just sending people things when they're going to need it. You can also anticipate these things. My next one is crawl before you walk. I can't tell you how many times I have heard people say, I want to be on Oprah. <laughs> or Ellen DeGeneres. And I say, well, that's really great. <laughs> and, and it's not that I mean, we can't get you there. It's just that it's a matter of needing to crawl before you walk. And this is really important for you to understand or your bosses to understand because they're the ones who are saying, oh, get me in Forbes, get me here, get me there. But the reality is you need local press, before you can get national press. You need national press before you can get international press. And if you go in that sort of a flow or order, it's much more useful. The other thing is that if you only have local appeal, 
you're not going to necessarily get international pickup. So think about who the audience is that's reading those publications and why they would be interested in you. If it's an online company, you're golden, right? Because you have more appeal. You can get more pickup. Understand the media outlets and their readers before you contact them. I've heard this so many times, people just say to me, they didn't understand what I do. I got sent this ridiculous pitch. <laughs> right? They just don't understand it. They don't get it. And those people get taken off or blocked from those people because it's, a dis it's disrespecting them and what they do. Because you aren't, um, you aren't giving them what they need and you're kind of wasting their time. So if you're going to send something to someone, read their column, read their articles, get a really good sense of who they are and what they're going to tell you. From there, you're more likely to have greater success. Okay, great visuals, not some crummy iPhone pics. <laughs> I tell people all the time I need good photos because storytelling is two parts, right? The first part is copy, and the second part is visuals. And if you have crummy visuals, that can make or break an entire story. Sometimes I can convince the outlet to come and shoot something for you, but more often than not, if you don't have professional photos, you're not going to get play. And that's just a matter of how things are. Most outlets want to just print your stuff. And so we always say 300 DPI, as high pixel resolution as you can, but at least 1020. And if you're taking photos on your phone, make sure they look professional, but really they usually don't. I mean, you can usually tell the difference between someone who has good lighting and setup compared to someone who just snapped a picture on their phone. And most startup companies, they'll do that, right? They'll just snap a picture on their phone. And they think that that's great. Uh, but the problem is then that translates into less press. Be creative and tell stories. So sometimes it's about thinking outside the box. So I was once working on this store on Main Street, and they came to me after they opened. In the PR world, that's kind of like, yeah, because <laughs> you've you missed that window of opportunity where you're going to get a lot of pickup. And she said, well, can't you just write about how new the store is? I said, but it's not new. It's six months old. That's not new anymore. <laughs> we're, we're, we're past that phase. The media is done with that. They, but they didn't write about us. No, you're not new. So we had to craft this event. And we had models walking in this fashion show, but we also had local designers walking in the show. And by crafting this little story, we were able to get picked up in the Vancouver Sun, the Georgia Strait, a whole bunch of TV stations. If we had just said, oh, we have a new store, but we opened six months ago, we would have gotten no pickup. So being creative to tell a story can often be really useful. Pay attention to the details. Watch out for spelling and grammar mistakes. For many years, I was an editor at an online publication. And you could always tell when people were using mail merge or some sort of system that just wasn't functioning properly because they would say, hello, Sarah, or hello, Janine, my name's Nicole, just in case you're wondering. So when you're getting an email that's not actually addressed to you but is addressed to you, you know that there's a disconnect. And right away, you're judging that person. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Also, for people like me who are crazy about good grammar, you notice those mistakes, especially if they're in the first few lines. Oh. Avoid attachments. This is a mistake I think a lot of people make. So I'm going to talk to you about when to use attachments and when you should just avoid them. If you're doing an initial pitch to an editor, you should avoid it. If you are uh, pitching to a TV producer, avoid them. Generally, if you're sending a mass press release out, avoid them. Some people like to just send some little snippet and then attach the press release. It doesn't get as much pickup. 
the odds are that most of the people who get your email are going to open it up and not open your attachment. So you're actually losing press by doing that. There can be good times to add attachments. That is, if you know that someone will be interested in what you're doing, and maybe, for example, you're attaching a lookbook or an annual report. But it's not the key pitch. It's not the key idea behind it. Make use of your prime real estate. So I always call in the email world your prime real estate being a headline and your first paragraph. This is the golden zone. If you can do a really good job with a title and a good first paragraph or head and or lead, you're going to get more people interested and they're going to read further or they're going to email you back and say, let's do something. Keep it simple. The average newspaper is written for someone with a grade six level education. So when we use highfalutin words, they're going to have to simplify them anyways. So make their job easier and use simpler words. The benefit of a mass press release is that most bloggers will just publish it immediately. So if you use really clean language, they'll be able to just copy and paste it right into their system. Never expose your contacts. And I was reminded of how important this is this week. Um, when I received this email from this organization, uh, that I'm an alumnus to, and instead of using the blind carbon copy field, everyone was in the two and CC field. Now, this is an organization that has a lot of people who are professionally in politics. So if you think about professionally in politics, a reporter at the CBC, uh, other media types in the organization, it's kind of a big faux pas because you don't really want other people to be sharing your contacts. Emailing is king unless someone calls you first. There is nothing I hear more complaints about than people who say to me, this person, that's all they do is they pitch me by phone. And when I was an editor, it used to annoy me too. Because I'm, my time is short and I want to prioritize. So send me an email and if it's interesting, let's talk over the phone. Think about your subject line. Don't use caps, you don't need to shout at people. Don't mark things high priority when you're sending them to the press. They're not. <laughs> we might think they are, but they're not. Uh, and they won't appreciate that. Let's get personal. So let's face it. Nobody loves a generic email. But realistically, sometimes that's what we have time for or money for. So we use them from time to time. There's nothing particularly wrong with that if you have to do it. If you think about it, it's similar to email marketing, right? You're sending a newsletter out. So think about your purpose with it. Oftentimes what we'll try to do is we'll personalize a certain percentage and mass send out the other percentage. That saves us time. That means that we're prioritizing the media outlets and people that we think are going to write about us first but not missing out on the other people. So try and come up with a system where you can personalize some and mass send out the other. Don't over send things out. That's a huge one. Just because you can send people something, if it's not a good fit, just don't. And so with every single send out we do, I personally go through and say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And that's something you should take the time to do because it will make a load of difference. Think about how to work with the parameters of the outlet, online or off, to benefit, benefit both parties. Now, typically, if you talk to a blogger, they will say to you, don't send me something that doesn't have my name on it that has a personal note. And I think a lot of TV producers feel the same way. So who are the people that you mass send out to? Well, Depending on how well you know them, you might do it more often. Two, usually newspapers are okay with it. But I also think about how I'm going to work with those people. So when I am sending that personal note, it's not just, hey, see this press release below, or see this content below, or here's this new idea. I'm actually giving them a reason that their readers 
might find it as interesting as I do. So I'm thinking about it from their perspective, not just mine. Nobody likes a spin doctor. A few times in my life, I've sat down at client meetings and had to walk away shaking my head because I've been asked to lie or fabricate the truth. And my personal opinion on that is that you just should never do it. If you can't be honest and tell the truth, then maybe you shouldn't be saying it. And I think that this is kind of the best way to say it. Don't fabricate stories. People want authenticity, not spin. And yes, journalists and, blo are, journalists and bloggers are people too. Sometimes we forget that, right? Because we're in pursuit of getting media attention. And so we kind of forget to humanize those people. It's not all about you. Take a step back and think about what's true and what's honest. Once you get press, thank the people who gave it to you. It's just that simple little note of gratitude. Sometimes I even still send out personalized thank you cards depending on what it was. But at the very least, an email, a tweet, a Facebook mention, something to show them that you respect them and you're grateful for what they have done for you. Because when we feel like people are grateful for what we've done, we're more likely to help them in the future. Put yourself in their shoes. Share the love. So most of you are managing Facebook, uh, Facebook pages, Twitter, etc. You should have a, a way to deal with when press comes in. How do you handle it? How often do you publish it? What do you say about it? And if applicable, you PR the PR. So what does PR and the PR mean? We do this very rarely, but sometimes it happens. So for example, I was working with um, a clothing brand, and Taylor Lautner was spotted wearing one of the shirts. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know who really who that was. Uh, but apparently he was really big in the Twilight movies, uh, and lots of people thought he was really important. So when you get a, um, something great like that, a celebrity wearing your shirt, uh, another one of my clients, uh, Ta uh, Taylor Swift, wore one of her dresses. So what do you do? You take those photos, you send it out to the press, and you say, look at how great this was. And the odds are you're going to get some more pickup. Just depends what it is. You don't do it all the time. Um, let's say you run a great charity event. This is um, Crystal just did this wonderful charity event for Chimp this weekend. Uh, the Vancouver Sun likes to give mentions in their charitable giving section. So uh, a smart thing to do is to send them a little email for the charitable charitable giving, and in a week or two she'll end up in the Vancouver Sun. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, so hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Sometimes this is difficult to do. Um, and if I give you bigger examples, uh, like, say, for exa example, the Tyre Woods fiasco, the Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky scandal, um, <laughs> the Anthony Weiner situation, et cetera, et cetera. I could keep going. It's just too fun. Um, but these kind of scandals, depending on how big or little they are, um, it really needs to be handled. And as community managers, you have to know that at some point something is going to go wrong. Someone is going to say something negative. Someone is going to post something negative. For me, the difference between Anthony Weiner and that is nothing. You deal with it exactly the same way. You have to have a plan. As Warren Buffett says, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. So think about the Rogers situation. Who's on Rogers or Fido? The network went down, right? Canada-wide network failure. And you know what kept happening? I don't know if you guys are watching this. Because I like PR management, I was kind of like watching their, their Facebook page and watching their Twitter page like relentlessly. It was actually ridiculous. Um, and one of the things I noticed is they just shut down. They stopped responding. They stopped responding to tweets. They stopped responding on Facebook. Now, if you were the community manager dealing with that or social media manager, 
you could kind of see where they're coming from, right? Because, oh my gosh, there's so much negativity coming in. How do we handle it? But they shouldn't have avoided it. They could have done a lot of things differently. Yes, on Twitter they were getting bombarded with people saying awful things about them. I'm going to switch providers, blah, 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 blah. But they could have been more proactive. They could have posted a link to the answers to all the questions that people kept asking because people kept asking repetitive questions. They were asking the same five questions over and over again and no one was answering them. That's a simple way to show people that you care. Same on Facebook. Set up a system where people can rant and rave, but also tell people what's going on. They didn't do that. And tell people what you're doing and what state you're in. That will help. So five tips for handling a PR crisis, and whether it is your Rogers or you just have a complaint, you should have a plan of action. And usually it's this. Assess, admit, address, atone, adapt. And if you use that system, it should help you most of the time. Now, some of the key things you'll want to work on is focus on trust. Communicate early and often. Don't go into the underground like they did. Listen for others' concerns. Share information. Simplify. And monitor all communication channels. Now, because they did such a bad job engaging with us while the situation was going on, most people the following day didn't even know that they had given people a day's credit. There was very few people who actually read that in the news. So that concludes sort of my very quick Go, go through of three different topics that I deal with very thoroughly on a regular basis. So I thought I'd leave some time for questions, if you guys have any. Yes? Um, you mentioned photos are really important. Yes. I definitely agree. But what do you think of stock photos? I don't love them. Yeah. Um, because usually you can tell they're stock photos or you'll find them in multiple places. I think it's worth investing in good photos. Um, and I think that you can find different... Uh, different companies in every genre doing a really good job. One of my favorites uh, in the non-for-profit sector is Charity Water, and that's a really good one to check out if you're looking at an example that isn't all about selling product, but rather selling ideas um, in a very visual way. I represent a, a non-profit um, working with translations in Africa so people can access the knowledge they need. How do I... Um, avoid telling the same tired, old, untrue story, you know, the, how, how can I tell that story in a new way? You want to get people sympathy, but not in, not in the way of a child with flies on their eyes. No. And that comes to, back to the out-of-the-box thinking, and knowing that you can't keep pushing the same material out. So, I would actually come up with um, a campaign strategy for the year and say, what can we talk about at different times of the year that could be a little bit interesting or look at this in a slightly different angle? Uh, what should your lead times be for events? Yes, okay, so this is a really good question. Um, lead times, I, I, I really don't like starting, uh, especially for an event, I know you guys do events, uh, with less than six months. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you have six months, you're more likely to get picked up in uh, magazines. If you have longer, it's better, because <laughs> uh, then you have some preparation time. In the US, the magazines are actually starting to work about eight months ahead, so depending on where you're working, you need to be working further ahead for magazines. Um, TV, radio, I like at least three months, just because then we can book further ahead, and they can't tell me, oh, our schedule's busy if they're interested. Uh, and newspapers, you can send quite a bit later. Um, you talked about time. So I'm with a new company, yep. um, and we're trying to get out. We don't have relationships with everyone. Are media kits something that are really important to be sending out, or is it more just a couple paragraphs about what you do uh, specifically? Um, well, I wouldn't send the media a couple paragraphs about what you do. I would send them a story idea. Um, and so 
I don't think you necessarily need to do that as an attachment. If you're going to do um, like an about the company, I would actually do it as a boilerplate. And that's what we put under press releases or under information when you want people to know about the company. And so in a boilerplate, it just says about the company, colon, and then a description in a paragraph or two, uh, as succinct as you can. Uh, the other option is you can have a, a bio page, and that would be okay to attach, but expect that someone probably isn't going to open it. So still use your email really efficiently. Use that time real estate. Uh, what do you think about ha having a link uh, to your website um, in the email rather than attachment? Oh, it should definitely be there. Yeah. yeah. The, the name of your company, your link to your um, website should all be in the main document as well as contact information. But like if you were, say for instance, um, you were saying you could uh, have a cut and paste of a press release. Yeah. Um, would you suggest that you just link to that uh, on your page so that other people can just you know, find the press release easy and cut and paste it? Because if you, if you put too much into an email, then people are just going to be, oh, that's maybe too much, I'm not reading all that. And like you say, catch yes. the first paragraph. So a, a press release should not be more than 300 words. Uh, and that's something that sometimes I see people make a mistake with is they make their press releases too long. Um, what I would recommend is if your press release is actually newsworthy and you want people to read it, you know, personalize your pitch, put it right under your signature line. You can post it on your website if you want to, but I would leave that out entirely because they're less likely to go to your website with that link. Um, two questions. When you think about exclusives, <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my link, and, um, and contacting editor or journalists from the same publication. Okay, so exclusives, I love them. I do them all the time. I think it's a really excellent way to get on someone's good side. You have to use them sparingly, and you have to be really careful not to um, hurt people's feelings because people might get upset that you're favoring one person over another. Um, so when I do it, I make sure I do it in such a way that the exclusive makes sense for that particular publication, that particular person. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I've had the experience where they haven't actually told me that they're going to run it, so I don't, I can't really give them the exclusive until they give me that confirmation, right? Oh yeah, no, I don't. When you off, when I offer an exclusive, like. There is an agreement there that they're going to, for example, um, one of the events we did last year, we gave a certain number of people an exclusive, and what that meant was that they actually had a day lead time on the press release, and they were, they worked with us, and they always published it before the other people. Um, and your second question? Contacting um, journalists from the same publication. It, it can work as long as... As long as they're in the same area and they both will be interested. So, for example, uh, if you're contacting the editor in chief at the Vancouver Sun and the lifestyle editor, the odds are the editor in chief doesn't care. So, as long as they're a reporter that is in an area of the publication that will care about what you're saying, then I think it's fine. Um, what's your follow up strategy, and do you send multiple press releases in a sequence with different twists? Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. And how many? <laughs> oh gosh, it depends how how I feel. <laughs> and how, so, I sit down on a campaign and I say, how many ways can I look at this? So I don't actually say I'm going to do this many sendouts. I say, how many ways can I look at this? And then from there, I craft different types of stories. Um, but typically, on an event, you're looking at a minimum of three sendouts, minimum, and that's just major sendouts not including event listings or media invites, etc. And how do you usually space them? As, as much as I can. So like I said, uh, the six months out is really great because then I can actually send the press release out six months ahead of time, and then I can send it again three months later to the people who don't need it that soon. Uh, and then as you get closer to the event, um, every month-ish. So... If I wanted to take like a bigger dive into PR, yes. what kind of resources would you recommend that I check out to like learn more? Okay, so the number one thing that I would say is you can buy media lists, but you shouldn't. So there are services online where you can go buy a media list. Those are the worst things that you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Most of them are generic emails, um, and most of those people don't want to hear from you because you haven't introduced yourself to them. 
So what I would recommend is read as many publications as you can. When you find uh, an editor who has something, to, like uh, they've written a column that you're, you're really interested in, send them an email. Say, that was really cool. Just start with really simple things. Um, start creating a list. Start meeting as many people as you can. And contacting them when it's useful to contact them, not just all the time. How often like, would you use a wire service? You know, if you have like, a, like the strategy of having more than one view you know, on the story board. I've, I've yes. done it before and I've only sent one. You know, and I felt like it wasn't enough that I could have maybe got more coverage if I'd given them a couple of extra angles. Um, now, that's an interesting, an interesting question. I've used wire services maybe two or three times. Uh, for really large events or really large clients who have the subscription to that service. What I find is that the pickup doesn't tend to be as good as my contact list. But I think it just depends on who's on your contact list and how effective that is. If you don't have anyone on your contact list, using it to start with would be good, but then trying to generate your own list uh, is actually better. Good questions. Any more? Do you need video? Um, my clients do video. I don't personally do video. What we'll do is we'll sit down and we'll consult, um, but generally more, more on the visual side than on the video side. Um, when someone says something negative about your brand, like with my company for legal reasons, sometimes we can't actually admit faults. Yes. What would you suggest in that situation? It's hard to say without knowing what it is, because um, the strategy might be different depending on what the situation is. My, my default is usually if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, kind of that old saying that your mom might have said, but sometimes that's not the best strategy depending on what the circumstances are. So especially with, with legal situations, it just depends. Um, yeah, yeah, because the, the more specifics I have, you, you would actually answer it differently. Now, people are going to say negative things about you, and you have a few options. Um, one is you can stop sending them stuff, right? And so that's, that's one tactic I've used before is that we had this uh, blogger who was writing really obscene things about not the clothing that my clients were wearing, but the models who were wearing it. And I was like, well, that's completely inappropriate. So we just took them off the list. Um, so gauging that, uh, sometimes negative comments happen and I, my clients will get worked up over it and I'll say, well, everyone's entitled to their opinion. If it's not slander and it's just literally an opinion of I didn't like the shoes, I didn't like the this, well, we can't control what everyone thinks about everything. So sometimes you just have to let it go. I was talking to Crystal earlier today about uh, sometimes the newspaper gets it wrong, right? I mean. I, I don't know if everyone's like me, but I like circle the mistakes as I read it. So if they can make that many typos, certainly the factual errors are also there. Uh, and she was mentioning this uh, inconsistency in the article, and she said, well, when do, you, when do you write to them and say, you know, this needs to be changed? Honestly, very seldom. And the reason is because I'm protecting my relationships more than I care about those changes. However, once one of my clients who was a spa, their photo was printed in... Um, a local publication, and it had another spa's name on it, so a competitor. So obviously that's a time where we need to kind of step in and say, thanks for printing it, but <laughs> wrong company. Uh, and so of course they felt bad about that, and they actually reprinted it the following week with our client's name on it. So that was a really nice way for them to handle that. If they're just small mistakes, we let it go. You, you have to think about how big the mistake is and pick your battles. Sometimes I think I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question actually is, does humor help? Does or humor help? I mean, I think that humor can be a, a dangerous zone because not everyone has the same sense of humor. So typically, we try not to go too far into an area where people might have different opinions on the humor if we do something humorous. but. 
generally we keep it more factual. Would you say though, Nicole, if you have a, a brand that you know is ironic or funny, or you're like that's the that's the brand you're trying to cultivate? Well, then, then you should definitely be that. Yeah, and you need to be true to who your brand is, right? So, um, like Dolce and Gabbana gets flack all the time for all their very risque ads and stuff, but really that's who they are as a brand. And if they weren't doing that, it wouldn't make sense for them. So you have to pick who your brand personality is and stick with that. Definitely. Um, so it just depends, right? So don't just use it with a corporation, but if, if that's who your brand is, then sure. If I'm going to hire someone to do press release for my company, what might be the key features I'm looking for? Okay, so I would look at samples of work. I would ask them what their pickup frequency is. And a big red flag for me is anyone who promises that they'll get you press. I've been doing this for almost 10 years, and I have never made that promise once, and I never will. And the reason for that is that you can't promise it. My connections are good, but maybe they won't like your stuff. And so I can't promise that you're going to get press. And I've heard that from people before who come to me and say, oh, I had the worst experience, we got nothing, and they promised me this and this and this and this. I said, well, that's red flag number one, because people in the profession who take their job seriously would never, ever, ever do that. Um, do you, so if you have a relationship with a, a media contact, would it be you that would like, be the corresponding over email, or do your team members also correspond? Like, do, would you recommend yeah. Um, it depends who it is. So depending on how my connection is with a particular person, sometimes I will send the email or make the phone call. Uh, or depending on how, if it's more likely for me to get pick up for me just calling them or emailing them, then I'll do that myself. Uh, but I do let my team help with emails and things like that. Is there a time of the day or a day of the week that's optimal for sending out a press release? It's a sweet spot. <laughs> You're really getting all my secrets. <laughs> um, I don't, now, and this is not like a fast and hard rule. Like sometimes you have to send things out because you're three days late and it just has to go out. I wouldn't hold it for a particular day to get it out. Um, so let's say your first press release was supposed to go out last week. It's now Monday. I would just send it. However, if we have lots of time, I love to send it on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, ideally Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and the reason for that is because on Monday, everyone's busy answering their emails and getting stuff done. On Friday, people are like half out the door. <laughs> like they might physically be there, but they're not. So the middle of the week is much better. But I wouldn't stop you from doing it at other times. Like I've sent things out at all times of the day. Would you do morning? I prefer morning because then I can deal with the pickups throughout the day. And I like there to be another business day after. So when you do it on Friday, usually people aren't looking at it until Monday. I prefer a Tuesday, Wednesday because then I can have the next two days to deal with uh, bookings. One thing I would add to that is knowing the editorial schedule of whoever you're pitching to. If, there's a, if it's a weekly publication and you know they go to press at a particular time, you don't want to send it just as they're going to press because yeah. a week, it won't get published for a week. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So, for example, um, the West Ender and Georgia Strait always go to print on Tuesday night. So, um, if you're if it's like you're really late, I would send it out on Monday, just because you you might get picked up. Um, you said about not making promises, but if you're paying, like let's say the West Ender, then you can make a promise, can you not? You mean you're booking advertising? Yes, if you're it, advertising, you can guarantee whatever you want. You can put whatever you want wherever you want it. Um, but primarily what people are paying me to do is get free sponsorship, so free time on air, free time on the radio, um, or free editorial coverage. So in those cases, I can't promise any of those things. If I'm doing part of your media buy campaign, I can tell you that, you know, and most of you probably know this, you know, you, you have a Facebook campaign, you're getting about a dollar a like, and, Etc. So you kind of know the metrics a bit more when you're doing advertising. If um, you're familiar with that uh, acronym of POEM, so the paid, owned, earned media. Yes. Um, what percentage do you think you should be going for as far as earned media in relation?
relationship to your other uh, medium? Oh, that's hard to say. Um, I always say that if you're paying for advertising, you need to have a big budget. If your budget is small, it's not worth doing at all. Um, editorial, I think, should be higher than advertising, depending on like, what your budget is. Sorry, but what's small? Like, what do you mean by small? I know it's all relative. It, yeah, <laughs> it's relative to what the, the, the company is and what you're buying, but they say that people don't actually remember who you are until they've seen you three or four times. You can guarantee that people are not going to notice your advertisement until they've seen it three or four times, if not more. So to book a week on the radio is not really worth it. To book two weeks is. And if you know how expensive radio is, you know that that's getting you into almost $20,000. Yeah. So if, and I've had people say to me, can we just book three days of radio? And I say, no, don't waste your money or time. Now, if you're doing maybe a one full page in the Georgia Strait the week before an event is, that's a little bit different because the odds are people will see it if it's that big. So it just depends on the on the medium. Sorry, you interrupted me. You were going to the Oh, yes. Um, every company will be different. It is pretty much what I have to say to that. So look at your your manpower, look at your budget, and then I would percentage it off based on that because every client I've ever worked with, we've done it differently. <coughs> Any other questions? Can you tell us like a cool like success story for like nonprofits or getting to press? Getting to press. Like local. <laughs> um, well, most of my stuff ends up in press, so I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Mm. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like ideas that you could like a story that can maybe inspire us to like use a similar format or something like that. Yeah, I think the the fashion show for the new new store is a really good um, idea, just in that it it takes something that's no longer news and turns it into a new story, and that's your goal with everything you're doing. Um, one of the companies I work with regularly is Coco Nymph. They're an amazing chocolate store. If you guys have ever been it's there, well. sorry. It's well. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, and one of the things that we did was we created. Um, you know, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, they had those gold pickets. Mm -hmm. So we actually created this whole guerrilla marketing campaign where we were going to have gorilla, um, golden tickets around Vancouver, and we were going to tell people where the locations were. And we got so much media pickup from doing this just because it was a clever idea. It kind of fit with the chocolate and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory kind of theme. Uh, but we got so much media attention that we had parents calling the store, and they were like irate. They were so mad that we were doing this when kids were in school. <laughs> and, and my client put the phone down. I said, you know it's worked when you're getting people upset that they can't participate. So it, it's about creating these ideas that then other people want to write about and other people want to talk about and it gets everyone excited. It looks like we're getting close to done. So Are you getting that hurting? I'm, get, I'm getting people standing up behind me. But thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to me. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>